Well, good morning, everyone. If you don't know me, my name is Joel, and I get the privilege of serving in our church as our lead pastor with an amazing team of people, and so I'm just glad to see you. Welcome today. I want to go back in time with you to the winter of 2019. And so this is in our family's journey and our story. We had been in conversations with the leadership here at New Life. We knew we were going to be moving. We'd shared with our family and friends what's going on. And so we're still living in Canada. We know this is our last winter and we're thanking God for that and all sorts of fun stuff. But this particular winter, we wanted to milk all the time we could with the people that were closest to us, the friends that we had made and the relationships that we had. And so this one wintry day in, in December, at some point in December, we're out at our friend's house. It's really like a farm where they live. And, and they had four daughters that were kind of the same age as our girls. And we're just enjoying being with them because we know the time is short. And that's kind of one of the, the things that when, you, when you, God calls you to somewhere new, sometimes you just you have to, I love you guys and we'll see you again someday. And you, you start the next adventure. So we're just having this beautiful day. And my youngest daughter, Brooklyn, comes in with her counterpart in their family, their friend Shiloh. And they're like, Dad, the, the sled hill's just not running. It's just, it's not good snow this year. And, and I've been in Canada, it's my seventh winter. And I'm like, oh, I understand. Like there's different kinds of snow. So so I get it. So I'm like, let me go see what I can do. Like, I can change the snow, right? But like, you know, I'm a, I'm a dad, and I'm really wanting to make this beautiful moment for them because the, the days are short together. And, and so I just see, like, the, the, the snow hill is just not really flowing well. And, and then I go, and I see my buddy Kyle. We're at Kyle and Anna's house, and I see their awesome quad side by side with the snow scoop in front of it. And I'm like, I know what to do. And so I jump into their quad. I fire this thing up, and I head to the top of that hill, and I'm just looking down, and I'm like, I'm going to carve a path. And I'm going to make a way for my daughters and their friends to have this awesome time together. And so gravity's on my side. So we start heading down that thing. And it's pretty steep. And I'm just plowing through. And I'm like, this is awesome. Look at how incredible this is. And, and then I get to the bottom of the hill. And now I'm in deep snow. And I realize, I don't really know what to do next. <laughs> and so I try to turn. The thing won't turn. I'm like stuck in deep snow. So I'm like, I'll, I'm just going to put it in the four-wheel drive boat and just back up the, the hill that I made. And I get about a third of the way up and I realize I'm stuck. Like, this isn't a good moment. And I'm like, this is the last memory my friend Kyle's going to have of me. Good job, Joel. You got my quad stuck in that one. And so I, like, there's nothing I can do. It's beyond me in this moment to fix it. And so I just kind of pop out. I go walking back up the house, kind of the walk of shame. And, and I'm like, hey, Kyle, what are you doing? <laughs> he's like, I'm just, you know, hanging out. And he's like, hey, like that, how's the tractor running right now? <laughs> And so sure enough, Kyle had to come out and help me, and he had to get his big tractor out and had to attach the quad 4x4 four four to the tractor at an angle that was definitely dangerous. And slowly and surely, we had to work our way up. And I, I mean, I was just, I'm sitting in the quad, and he's like, Joel, you sit in the quad and just follow the directions I'm giving you. When I say hit the gas, hit the gas. When I say hit the brake, hit the brake. And I have this beautiful picture of my friend Kyle. You don't really see Kyle so much in this picture, but you see me in this moment. And there we are just kind of hanging out. And that's Kyle in the mirror as I'm trying to take the picture of him in the tractor. And, and we're just there. And we spent about an hour on that hill working together to get the thing that I got stuck unstuck so our daughters could have a beautiful day together. And I just remember as I was sitting there just kind of like laughing at the moment because sometimes that's all you can do. And, and just watching Kyle, like Kyle was the man of Canada. Like he was the quintessential Canadian man in that moment. Just watching him maneuver this tractor like he was driving a transformer or something and just making things happen. I just started smiling. I'm like, God, like, Kyle's like you in my life right now. Because there, there's just so many times in my story, in this, this life that God has called me into, where I just get stuck. And she's like, God, I don't, I don't know how to move forward. I know you're calling me to something or you're putting something in me and I don't know what to do. And and just in that moment, I was like, like, God, this is just like a beautiful picture of what it's like to walk with you sometimes. That all I got to do is just kind of sit and hang out and listen to you say, Joel, go, or Joel, stop, or Joel, watch, and, and let you do the heavy lifting. And it's just this beautiful reflection. I think that we can have this sense of hope in our stories as Jesus begins to show up and we trust him with our life and we start to follow after him, that God begins to do things in us. And I think there's just this hope that we can have that even when you can't, God can. God can do amazing things in your life and through your life. And I think we find this, that, that as God starts to show up, there will be times where God wants to stir in us new desires to trust him and follow him, surrender areas of our life to him, and call us to new things that feel like it's beyond us. Like, God, I don't know if I could do this. Like, when God called us to Canada, I was like, yeah, right. And yeah, do I trust him with this? And 
watching what God wants to do in our story because there's times where God's going to want to move in us to grow us and help us step more deeply into this life he's come to give us. Like God will actually change our thoughts to be in sync with him so that we begin to think the way God thinks about life and reality. And that, that I begin to see the world from God's perspective and it's so much greater than just our perspective. And, and that blows your mind sometimes. But to, to, to begin to trust him with those areas of life. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk with you in this. Or God will begin to work in us freeing us from like the, the broken habits and choices that we all get sucked into in our stories. And wanting to awaken something new in us to, to walk and live a different way in life. Or, or God will begin to put within us new attitudes, the way we think about people or the way we treat other people. And sometimes that's beautiful because he's doing something new in us. Like we've seen consistently in this, this, this series that we've been in that God's constantly at work in our lives. But it's not always easy, is it? Because sometimes there'll be things that well, God will call us to and it just feels like, it's, God, it's beyond me. Like, I actually don't know if I can do this, or if I'm being really honest, I don't even know if I want to do this. And we can wrestle with God in those moments, and yet I think the the hope that we can have is this idea that even when we can't, God can. God can do things in our story to empower us to live this life he has for us. And this is what so many of the first followers of Jesus discovered in their own journey, in their own story, as they walked with Jesus and followed him into this life he came to give us. So if you've ever heard of this guy, Peter, Peter was like one of Jesus' closest friends. And so Peter was the guy that gives every one of us hope because he was the guy who stumbled after Jesus. And Jesus was like, let's go, bro. Let's, you got this. And, and yet Peter, as he grew in his faith, he writes these words in one of his letters that we have recorded in this book. He says that, that God's power, God's divine power in our lives has given us everything we need to live the life God has for us. That that God is at work in our story. Like everything that you and I need to to follow after him, God's like, I've got this for you. I'm going to put this into you. You can do it. Paul, the the guy who's writing this letter that we're going to be diving into in just a minute, Paul will write this about himself. He'll be looking at the life he lived and he's like, you know, I look at all the other first followers of Jesus and he's like, I actually worked harder than any of them. Like, I did more than any of them to to propel the message of Jesus. But then he steps back and he goes, but it really wasn't me. It was God's grace at work in my life. And this is one of the reasons why we want to look to this generation of followers in the first century because of what they discovered in their own story. And the things that they wrote down and recorded for us. Because as we look to them, it gives us hope for our story today as we see what they discovered and what they told us about the life that they walked into as they walked with Jesus, it gives us hope for our story today. Help for us to discover how we can step into this life that God has for us. And so I I don't know what you walked in with today. I don't know where your story's at. If you're just on a journey of, I'm just checking it out, trying to figure it out. I'm glad you're here because I think God has something for you. Maybe you've been around the block a long, long time and the good news for you is you don't have to be old in your faith, you can let God still do new things in your life as we learn to trust him and listen to him. And so we're going to jump into what Paul has to say today as we get back into this letter that he wrote, what we have in this book that we call Philippians. It's one of the letters written by this early Christian leader, Paul, to this group of Christians in the first century. And and Paul has a special relationship with them because once upon a time, he visited the city of Philippi where they were living, and he began to introduce them to Jesus. And he helped get this church started. And And so now he's in a different place in his life. He's moved on, and he's actually in prison because of what his message of Jesus had cost him, and yet he's writing back to them to encourage them and help them in their journey and their struggles. And I love this, what we're going to see what Paul has to say here, because it will have hope for us in our story today. And so let's get ready to jump into this and see what we can unpack together. And so we're going to jump right into Philippians 2, and we're going to jump into verse 12, and look look at here what Paul writes to these first followers. He says, dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I'm away, it's even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. And I love what we get from Paul as he's writing this. He's writing like with a father's heart towards his spiritual kids. Like he's looking out for them and he's wanting to encourage them. And what, what he's saying is like, hey, remember when we were doing life together and you kind of looked at my model and my example and you kind of did what I was doing? It's important that you keep doing that because ultimately it's not me you're following, it's God you're following. 
And so keep looking to him, keep trusting him, keep holding on to him, keep following him. And he said that there should be some result in your life as you do this. It's kind of like working out. Like, have you ever worked out? You don't have to raise your hand if that's an awkward question. But you know, you know like, have you known people who have worked out? <laughs> and if we're consistent in working out, something should happen in our life over time, right? Like, like we should get in more shape. We should have more energy or, or stamina or whatever it is. And what Paul's talking about, it's that same idea with, with pursuing the life God has for you. That, that as we continue to chase after that with him, there should be things that we begin to experience and express in our lives. Like, like we should be people who are growing deeper in our understanding of love. Like love for God and God's love for us and love for other people. Like we should be people who are experiencing a deeper understanding of what the truth of reality is as Jesus shows up in our story. We should be growing into a greater sense of courage as we chase after him in life. We should have a bigger sense of hope in our stories, no matter what the circumstances are today, that, God, you're bigger, and there's a future that you have for me. But God, you're doing something in my life. You're awakening things in me, helping me follow you. I should have a greater impact in my life into the life of other people. Like, this is what Paul's helping them understand. Like, there's this overflow of pursuing God in your story. And so he goes on, and he says this. Here's the hope that you can have. For God is working in you giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. And what a beautiful hope that, that God just doesn't call us into this new life and say, good luck with that. Like God's actively at work in our story. Like Jesus promised that as we stepped into this life with him, he would put his spirit in us to guide us and lead us. And so God's now at work within us, giving us the ability to chase after him in this life that he has for us. That's the hope that all of us can have, that we're not left on our own to figure it out, that God's at work in the story. And so Paul wants them to begin to understand, as you partner with God, as you let God work in your life and you cooperate in that process, you'll begin to see him doing some neat things. And so he's going to give some thoughts and encouragement here on how to keep pursuing that with him. And so he goes on and he says, Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining the bright lights, shining as bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Because this is a broken world with a lot of hurt and pain in it. And there's a, a lot of people that really don't care what God has. And I don't know about you, but sometimes it's really easy to get hurt or frustrated by them and to become what I would just call a cynical follower of Jesus. And like what Paul is saying is like, don't let that change who you are. Like, keep pursuing him without complaining, without becoming bitter, because there's hope in your story. And the best way you could hope people that could care less about God is by loving them with the hope you have. So keep going. And so he says, hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I'll be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. Like what Paul's saying is like, I've invested my life in you. I, I've let the overflow of God in my life pour into you. And so what I want for you is that you would hold on to this word of life. The truth of Jesus that you've experienced. Don't give up. Because what Jesus said, and to those of us that would follow after him, what Jesus said is like, I've come that you could have life. The fullest life you could ever hope for. And so the reason we hold on to Jesus is because he's giving us truth that sets us free and changing us from the inside out. And so Paul's like, hold on to that. That's like some good stuff. Don't give up on what he's doing. And he says, but I will rejoice even if I lose my life. Because he's writing from prison and he doesn't know his future, but it's very possible that he realizes I might be killed because of following Jesus. But that's not a bummer in my story because God's at work. So I'm going to rejoice even if, even if. Pouring it out, my life out, like a liquid offering to God. Just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice and I will share your joy. Like what Paul's helping them understand is that is, as you begin to invest your life in another person, just like Paul was investing their life in others, this beautiful overflow of God at work in a story begins to happen. And what Paul's saying is that that's how you actually experience joy in life. You be faithful to what God's doing in your story and you let that spill out into the lives of other people. That's what Paul's saying. That's my joy is seeing what's going on in your story. And so now I want you to experience the same thing. So give God your best and serve him. 
that's your sacrifice to worship him and that will overflow into the people around you. And that's how we experience joy because if we just try to keep it all to ourselves, we just stagnate. But when we let the overflow of God spill out to people around us, then God meets us and he fills us again and again and again. And that's a cycle of joy as we get to be a part of other people's stories. And so here's Paul, and I love what Paul's talking about here. I love how he's speaking in this moment. He's like, he's using his father's voice to speak into their lives. And I love this because that's what a father does. A father looks out for his kids. It's the beauty of a father's heart. Like a good father is willing to love and encourage his kids. And a good father is willing to look out for his kids by speaking words of correction and words of protection. And so here's what Paul's doing in this moment. And I love this because what we have here is Paul's words that were written to a specific them in the first century. Like, do you realize, like, when you're reading, especially the letters in the New Testament, like, you're actually reading someone else's mail? It's kind of creepy if you think of it like that. (laughs) But here's the reality. Even though it was written to a specific them, it's still for us because these are not just Paul's words. Like, God's at work in what Paul's doing, and so that we know that these are God's words for all of us. This is our Father wanting to speak to us through this person's letter. And if we're willing to lean in and listen, we'll hear our Father's voice speaking his words to us as he's looking out for us, as he's seeking to help us discover something powerful and hopeful for our lives as we look to God to help us live in the reality of this life he's inviting us into. That's why when we look at pursuing Jesus, this isn't about religion. Religion is about like jumping through hoops or measuring up to make yourself good enough, but the life Jesus calls us into is trusting him to work in our story so we experience his goodness bringing us into our best. And that's why I love what Jesus is all about, and that's why I want to learn from guys like Paul as they've experienced this in their own story. And so I want to lean in a little bit and focus on something that Paul says that I think is so helpful for us when we're in the journey and we're just trying to figure it out and we sometimes feel like we're getting stuck along the way. And so I love what Paul writes here in verse 13 when he says this, He says, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Like that is a simple sentence with profound implications. Because think about what Paul's saying here. God, all-powerful creator of everything, is at work in you. He's at work in you, his spirit coming close as we step into this new life Jesus has for us. This is not some God at a distance. This is the God who comes close to walk with us. And what he's doing in us is something that's so life-giving. He's producing a couple things in us. He's giving us the desire and the power to embrace the life he's calling us into. And I don't know about you, but I need that because like I've said before, there's times in my life where I'm like, God, I don't even know if I want what you're offering. And there are times where I don't even know if I can do what you're asking. But if you're saying you can work in my story to awaken my heart to beat with you and to empower me to embrace the things that you have, then I will step into that with you. But you better show up. (laughs) And see, that's the hope that we can have, that even when you can't, God can. God can. And I need that hope in my life because oftentimes I will find that, that what God wants in my story, what God has for me, it will sometimes feel like it's so beyond me. Have you ever experienced that? Like we look at the things that Jesus teaches us and sometimes we have this view of Jesus. It's like what I would just call like a Sunday school Jesus, like, like a childlike Jesus. And I'm not talking about a childlike faith. I'm talking like a childish view of Jesus where we're just like, oh, he's just like this cool hippie that just kind of signs off on my life and never challenges me. And yet the reality is if you take Jesus' teaching seriously, it's going to challenge you. Because Jesus says stuff like this. Love your best friends that you like. Like Obviously he calls it that. But no, he he takes it deeper, right? What is it? He says, love your enemies. I'm like, "Uh, what? Like, Jesus, can we just have a conversation? The reason I don't love my enemies, Jesus... Because they're my enemies. Like they've hurt me or wronged me or I've got some darkness in my life towards them, but we do not get along. 
And yet Jesus says, no, I, if you want to become who I created you to be, I want you to love your enemies. I need help with that. Because it's in those moments that I begin to wrestle with things like that that God will call me to that I find within me this, this kind of dissonance in my spirit. Like a dissonance between what God is calling me to and what I'm finding to be true about myself in those moments. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever wrestled with that? Is it only me? All right. You, well, then, you, then this is for me today. That's awesome. <laughs> oh. And that dissonance between what God is calling you to and what you're wrestling with about yourself will oftentimes cause you to step back and say, I can't do this. Or God, I don't even know if I want to do this. And we have to wrestle with those moments because it's really easy in those moments to begin to excuse ourselves from the life God has for us. Well, God, that's just not who I am. Or God, that's just not how I am. You know what I mean? And a lot of times what we'll actually begin to do is to spiritualize our excuse because then we'll look to like things in, in the Bible even to try and justify that. And we'll just say like, well, God, no, this is how you made me. So therefore, I don't have to do what you've called me to do because this isn't true of who I am, what you're stirring in my life, what you're calling me to. It's just that's not who I am. That's not how I am. And one of my favorite psalms that we have in the scripture, those are the, the songs of ancient Israel in the Bible, is the song of identity written by a guy named David. So if you're familiar at all with people in the Bible, David's the shepherd boy that got to become king, killed the giant. In Psalm 139, David writes these beautiful words about identity. In verse 14, he says these words reflecting on who he is and his relationship with God. He says, God, I, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Like, God, your works are incredible. I know that full well. And it's just this beautiful affirmation of David beginning to understand who he is as someone created by God, as a child of God. And yet sometimes what we'll do is we'll take that verse, that moment, and we'll say, yeah, see, David understands that how he's created is good. So God, this is just who I am. So obviously I don't have to do the things you're calling me to. And yet when we do that, we miss the point of what David is saying. Because what David's doing, he's actually affirming who he is as a person created by God, but he's not affirming how he is. Because do you know David's story? Dude did some dark stuff. Like when he was king, he abused his privileged position, took advantage of a woman named Bathsheba who's married to another guy. He basically violates her, whether she was a participant or not. He's abusing privilege, gets her pregnant. Uh-oh, I need to try and cover this up. It doesn't go well. So then he has her husband killed. I don't think what David is saying in Psalm 139 is, but God, that's just who I am, and it's awesome. I think what David is doing is affirming who he is, but he recognizes he needs help. Because I love how he ends Psalm 139 in this beautiful psalm of identity. He says, so God, would you, would you search me and know me? Like, would you test me and know if there are any anxious thoughts in my head or offensive ways? And, and then, God, would you lead me into the life of everlasting life with you? And I love that because it gives me hope that it's okay to invite God into the wrestling. It's okay to invite God into that place of saying, like, God, when who I am as I am doesn't seem to, to live up to who you want me to be or even who I would long to be, it's okay to say, God, please help me. God, please show up in my story and do something for me. And I'm so grateful for this because the reality is we're all an ongoing work in progress. Like we talked about this last week, like some of us are a serious piece of work, right? And yet our hope is that we're his piece of work now. And I think that we forget this sometimes along the way. And so then we get surprised when we get hung up on the things that God calls us to. And like, God, I don't know, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I want to do that. And, and yet maybe we let him into the story with us instead of just choosing the, to those moments where we kind of get stuck on what God's doing and just like, I guess I can't. I mean, how weird would it be if I was just on a phone call right now and I'm still sitting on that hill in Canada stuck in the, the quad in the 4 by 4 Like, that would just be really weird, wouldn't it? Joe, it's been like three winters. What are you doing? Just, just, I'm just stuck in the quad. It's just who I am. Instead of maybe saying, God, can you help me? Can you show up in my life? Can you do a work in me? And so here's some really, really good news. Needing help? 
is kind of a prerequisite to following Jesus. So if you've ever wondered, like, can Jesus, is Jesus for me? Like, do I have to be good enough? If you recognize you need help, good news. Because Jesus is really good at helping people like us who need help. I mean, Jesus said this in Mark chapter 2. He said, hey, it's not the healthy that need the doctor. It's those who are sick. And then Jesus said, I didn't come to call the self-righteous. Like those that think they've got it all figured out. Those who think they're, they're good on their own. He said, I've come to call sinners. Like people who are broken and have mess and struggle in their story. Thank you that you came for people like me. Because I need that in my life. And see, there's this point in time then when, when we begin to encounter Jesus. That we recognize our need for him. And, and as he begins to show up in our life and in our story. And we're drawn to him we can kind of respond to him in one of two ways. So because if I'm fine as I am, why am I drawn to him? I think it's because there's something within me that's like, I need need what you're offering. But we have to decide how we respond to him in those moments. Because sometimes when Jesus shows up, we're like, hey, cool. Jesus, would would you sign off on my life and follow me? I think that's how we respond to Jesus sometimes. And I think what Jesus wants to say is, hey, would you follow me? Because I've come to give you a whole new life. And to follow him into that life requires a moment when we're willing to surrender ourselves as we are and ask for him to come and begin to do his new in us, his beautiful work in us. And that's the hope of Jesus doing something new in our life. And this is the beauty of what we see Paul talking about here. This beautiful overflow of God doing his work in us as we cooperate with him and we partner with him. And when we find ourselves in that place of wondering, that place of of wrestling, God, I don't know if I can do this. God, I don't know if I want to do this. Here's the good news. When you can't, God can. God can show up in your story. God can do amazing things. And so here's a question I have to constantly ask myself when I'm finding that dissonance showing up in my life. When I find myself wrestling with the things God is putting in front of me and that he's calling me to. This is the question I just have to step back and ask in those moments when I don't think I can do it or I'm not sure if I want to do it. I just ask myself, okay, but is this thing still the right thing? And is this thing still the good thing? And is this thing the God thing? Like, is this what God actually desires for me and wants from me? And if the answer is even a fuzzy yes, then what I have to do and choose to do in those moments is to say, God, even though I don't know if I can, and honestly, I don't know if I want to, I'm going to trust you to show up in my story. I'm going to trust you to bring the big backhoe down and get me unstuck so I can begin to walk in the things that you have for me because God is the one at work within us, giving us the desire and the ability, the power to follow him. That's the hope I have every day as a follower of Jesus. That, Joel, you don't have to be good enough. You can look to God at work in your story and trust him to bring the good into you so you can follow him. And so let's, let's chase this idea a little bit. Maybe just kind of flesh it out a little bit. And I just want to talk through like, like two kind of arenas in our life. There's multiple arenas. But let me just kind of focus it in on a couple arenas to, to maybe help paint a picture of what this could look like. And so let, let's talk about this from the perspective of, of what it means to be church together. And so if we're followers of Jesus, he, he calls us into this new family, this new community called his church. And what's really cool about that is everyone who follows Jesus is invited into it. What's really hard about that is everyone who follows Jesus is invited into it. (laughs) Right? So that means we have to figure out how to do life together and walk together. And yet as we begin to walk together, what he wants to do is call us to help him build his church. So what that means is that within a church, there's no such thing as bench warmers. Like we're all called to play a part in one way or another. Whether that's, that's in formal ways. So like trying to be church and create church together on a Sunday morning. And, and we have teams where people can come and serve. Whether it's in this room or, or our young ones where we have a whole crew of people helping make church happen for them. 
or, or it's through our resources and God, I want to give this to you to help build your church. Formal ways like that, or maybe it's informal ways. So you're walking in a group with other people and, and a need comes up and you're like, God, how can I just help support my friend in this moment and walk with them? Like those are ways that we just step into those moments to help them build a church and God begins to wake us up to things and invite us to help do it. Now, now here's, here, here's what I just want to say. If you're on this journey of discovery and you're not sure where you're at, like absolutely come and journey with us and just kind of hang out until you begin to figure out if this is the life God's calling you into. I, I would just want to give you permission for that. Because so often the journey is, is like waking up super early in the morning and you go for a walk and you can't really see anything, but then the sun is starting to rise a little bit. That's what discovering Jesus is often like. It's like he's just slowly but surely turning the lights on. And what I would just encourage you to do is he begins to make things clear to you. Just take that step and take that next step as he wakens you to this life he has for you. But for those of us who have taken that first step of faith in Jesus, he wants to begin to wake us up and produce things in us to give us this life. And so he'll call you to things in the life of a church that oftentimes feel like it's beyond you or you don't even want to. So can I have a moment of confession with you right now? I am terrified of public speaking. I am. This is how I know God has a sense of humor. Who is the most awkward dude I can find? I'm going to call him into being a pastor, and I'm going to make him go and stand in front of people and talk. And I remember when God began to awaken this in my life, I was like, no, what are you doing? Like, I remember when I was a teenager, I was making announcements at my high school church group, and all I had to do was go up in front of my peers, about 30 or 40 of my high school friends, and say, we're going to SeaWorld this summer, sign up. And I gripped the stupid music stand, and I said, like, like, I think my youth pastor thought I was, like, dying, and I just looked at him, and I'm like, I can't do this. And I just kind of walked off. And I remember I walked out, and I'm like, God, I'm never doing that again. By the way, never say things like that to God. Because I think what God likes to do is look at us when we think we can't, and he's like, let me show off in your life. Let me show up in your life. Let me show you how great I am and what I can actually do through you. I think God likes to use those moments because he gets the credit, right? <laughs> And so now I I come to this moment every time God calls me to teach. And I'm like, you better show up. Because if it's just me public speaking, it's not going to go well. God will call you to things that it'll feel like it's beyond you. It's beyond your means or your resources or your time or your energy. But do you believe that God can work in you? awakening a desire for what he has for you and giving you the power to do it. And so when that happens, we take that step of faith towards what God has for us, trusting that as we move, he'll move in us. That's just one area that like like this whole thing that Paul's talking about, that even when we can't, God can, can play out. Let's step into a new arena for a minute and unpack this. One of the things that will begin to happen as you take Jesus seriously is he'll begin to awaken you in how you do relationship with other human beings. He'll begin to say, okay, everyone is created in the image of God. Everyone has value and worth. Yes, everyone is broken and it's a messy place. But if we perpetuate the brokenness and the mess, we get issues like what's going on in Ukraine right now. And God's heart and desire for us is to not be like that, to be people of peace in this world. And so he'll begin to work in us, calling us to do our relationships in radically different ways than the ways of this world. In a very simple way, he'll call us into doing relationship different than the way the world does it, will be in the willingness to forgive other people when they wrong us. That is hard. I love forgiveness when I need it and it's given to me. I love that. But when it's suddenly God saying, Joel, I want you to forgive that person. That's when I'm suddenly in that category of God. I can't, I don't even know if I want to. I'm in school, working through college. I'm set up at a coffee shop, just trying to get some work done. 
And I love working in coffee shops because I can be around people, but I can put on headphones and it's kind of like, leave me alone. <laughs> Introvert life. Um, and so I'm in this coffee shop and I suddenly look up and, and there I see him. This guy I hadn't seen in like 10, 12 years. This guy who had come into my family and wreaked havoc. He had hurt people close to me. He had caused financial impact. And, I mean, it was just, it was damaging. And it wasn't direct to me, but I was like the, the little kid who got the collateral damage from everyone else's pain. And this dude was the source of it all. And I remember as I see him, like my heart just kind of stops and I can't catch my breath. And I have all that pain coming back inside of me. And I'm like, oh, what do I do? And God, I don't, like, what is this? And, and like, I'm panicking inside. And, and in that moment, I just feel like God kind of showing up and doing a couple things. I think one just kind of like holding me, like, and whispering that voice, like, little man, it's okay, I got you. And then just kind of prompting me. And sometimes we'll say, like, I hear God talking to me. And I, I don't know if we actually understand what that means. It's not necessarily this voice. I think sometimes God is just, he'll put ideas in our heads that aren't ours. Because his spirit is inside of us, just whispering truth and life. And so in this moment, I just sense him saying, Joel, this is an opportunity to go and forgive him. And I'm like, No. <laughs> no. <laughs> But it's just that, that, that way that God can kind of just speak with a, a gentle weight that you can't shake. And so I'm like, okay, God, but if you don't show up, it's not going to go well. And I remember just kind of standing up and shaking like a leaf in the wind. And moving to where this guy is. And, and just standing in this moment, like, like at the table, awkwardly waiting for him to rec recognize there's some weird dude standing by your table. And he looks up, and I can tell he doesn't recognize me because it's been like 10 or 12 years. And... And he's like, hey, and I'm like, hey, do you mind if I, like, can I join you for a moment? And he's like, sure. And I, I sit down and I, I just say these words, let me reintroduce myself. My name is Joel Enyart. And it triggered everything for him. He knew who I was and what this was all about. And his eyes got really big and he's like, oh, hey, man, how's it going? And I just remember, like, God just saying, like, like go for it. And I just said, like, hey, I, I don't want to take too much of your time, but I just... I wanted to come over to you and just let you know, you, you caused a lot of pain in my life. You caused a lot of hurts. And, and I can't speak for anyone else in my family, but I just sense that God is wanting me to say these words to you. And so, dude, I forgive you. Literally, that was the extent of our conversation. And, all right, he's like, thank, thank you. And I'm like, cool. And I got up and I went and grabbed my stuff and I got out of there as fast as I could. And, and I'm walking away, and, and I just feel like God's meeting me in that moment again. And he's like, Joel, do you feel it? Do you feel all that weight that's, that's back there now? Like, you're not carrying it right now. And I just begin to realize, like, God, maybe forgiveness? Yes, it's for that person, but maybe it's, 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 it's as much for me as it is for them. That forgiveness is about finding freedom from the hurt. And so, God, would you help me do that again the next time? Because I need you to give me that desire and that ability to do it. And see, that's the hope that we have, that even when we can't, God can. And if we're willing to say, please help me, if we're willing to take that step of faith, trusting him, that as we move, he'll move in us. We'll experience him, him at work in our story. Empowering us and awakening within us the desire to live a life that he wants to free us to live. And so I, I don't know where, where the dissonance is in your story today, where the wrestle is with what God wants and where you're like, I can't or I don't want to, but here's the hope that I know you can have. It's the hope we can all have. If you ask him to show up, if you ask him to work, he'll step in because he's the one at work in you and he'll give you the desire and the ability to do what he's calling you to. And see, this is the beautiful thing about following Jesus. Is that Jesus didn't simply come to say some cool stuff. Jesus came to change our lives forever. And I, and I love that what Jesus says to his first followers that echoes through them to the rest of us. Where Jesus says, I'm gonna, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'll be with you always. 
that as we walk in this world, he promised to put his spirit in us, which means we'll never be alone in the journey. And we have the hope of him at work with us. And, and so I love this gift that Jesus gave us to help us remember this. It's this beautiful gift that we call communion. The, this thing that Jesus gave us to remember him. It's this beautiful dinner he's having with his first followers as they're getting ready to say goodbye and they don't even know it as Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross on, on their behalf and the world's behalf. And as they're having this meal together, Jesus takes some of the elements and he's like, hey, there's a new thing going on. And so he takes the bread and we're told that he breaks it and he says, this is gonna be symbolic of my body. This is my body gonna be broken for you. I will be broken for you so you don't have to live in brokenness anymore. And then we're told he takes the cup, he takes the wine, and this wine is, is a promise of what I'm going to do for the forgiveness of your sins, for all the brokenness in your life. I will pay for it in full through my life. I'm going to the cross to die the death that you deserve because of brokenness, but you don't have to die that death anymore. I'll die it for you. And she says, this is the cup of my blood. You drink this for the forgiveness of sins. And he says, whenever we do this, we do it to remember him. So communion is not about hanging our heads. Oh, communion is about lifting our heads and saying, thank you that you are in my story now. Thank you that you have come to give me new life. And in this moment, I remember you. And I will chase after the things that you have for me because I trust that you're at work in my life. I trust that you're awakening within me the desire and the ability to chase after all that you have for me. So as we go into communion in this moment, I want to invite you to take that hope with you to the tables. And so we've got four tables set up in the room. We've got these little baskets in them with these little communion things. <laughs> I just want to invite you to go and take them and take the wafer and take the drink and remember him in your story now. And if there's some dissonance in your life, invite him to meet you in that right now. Because that's the hope that we have that even when we can't, God can. And so, Lord, thank you that you've come into the story to save us and rescue us and breathe new life into us. Thank you that we can come as we are with the hope of your new life transforming us. So we want to come toward you. We want to come to you with our heads held high, saying, come and do your good work in us. Would you search our hearts? And if you find things that need tuning and changing, we give you permission to move in us so we can step with you into the fullness of life you have for us. Amen, amen.